This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just tell listeners and I guess viewers uh, who you are? Yeah, sure. Tanse, Gananaskamot, and Nanaskamot, and Upsis, and Nahiawak, Upsis, Rachel Dion Thunder. Hello, and thank you. My name is Rachel Dion Thunder. I am Plains Cree, Big Stone Cree Nation Treaty 8. I'm currently living in South Minneapolis. I am a co founder and board member of the Indigenous Protector Movement and part of the American Indian Movement. Well, you're an asset to have in South Minneapolis doing amazing work. And um, I wanted to talk, you know, originally I connected with you. I wanted to talk about a couple of things from the end of last year, but obviously um, the big thing that happened recently was the uh, Leonard Peltier situation. Um, on July 2nd, Leonard Peltier was denied parole. Um, I saw you posting some pictures, also some information from some events that were organized around the release, I believe, including the Leonard Peltier's walk to justice. Um, you know, now the, this announcement obviously is devastating. It's a huge blow um, to, you know, to anybody that cares about, uh, you know, freedom, dignity, et cetera. But also obviously, especially to folks that have been fighting for his release for years and years and years. Um, can you talk about how fe people are feeling and, you know, if what their next steps are here in the movement for his uh, release now, you know, he's been in prison for almost 50 years now. Right. Um, so like you said, Leonard Paltier, has been held unjustly by the United States federal system for nearly five decades. Um, he will be 80 years old this year in September. Um, he is the longest held indigenous political prisoner in United States history. Um, so when Leonard, you know, first went in over these five decades, the American Indian movement initially kind of, you know, like responded, you know, obviously like fighting for his release. Um, there's been a lot of work done over the past 50 years by many, many people, many organizations. There's been walks, there's been runs, there's been ceremonies, there's been um, international support, there's been support from the United Nations, there's been, um, you name it, there it has happened for Leonard Paltier and so I think that recently what we've seen is a resurgence and when I when I say recently I mean kind of more over the last five years a resurgence of um what I would say the younger generation being educated and interested in the story of Leonard Paltier and what his story means for our people and so in that five-year period, there's been a lot of organizing. Um, you know, the Leonard Peltier Freedom Run on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation has been going on for, I think, over two decades. I think I want to say 27 years. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of people going to attend that to put those prayers down for Leonard. Um, we planned and led a walk to justice for Leonard back at the end of 22 in the fall of 22, where we walked from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Washington, DC to that's raise awareness. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. To raise awareness um, and to advocate on his behalf for his release. Um, you know, the Indian collective and amnesty international co-facilitated the um, caravan to DC this past year where they caravan from Pine Ridge and Rapid City um, to Washington DC um, and then had an action there in front of the White House where a lot of indigenous activists were arrested um, and 
you know, all of this kind of has come to this boiling point where Leonard Peltier for the first time in 14 years had a parole hearing. Um, and we were all very, very hopeful. I think Leonard including uh, for his release to kind of go through this avenue. Um, but at the same time, I think that a lot of us were not surprised. Um, and, and that's just the unfortunate reality of his situation. And the reality of his situation is that the United States government and the Federal Bureau of Investigation wanted to make an example out of a Native American to say, if you resist us, if you resist our policies, our laws, this Western way of existence, because you have to remember at this time, like even it was illegal for us to have ceremony, like, right. you know, we couldn't have sweat lodge, couldn't have drum group, couldn't have Sundance. And so um, they were saying, you know, if you resist this Western way of life, this way of colonization, and you want to continue to live in this traditional way, that this is what will happen to you. If you fight for your people, this is what will happen to you. If you stand up and, you know, fight us, we will make sure that you're not able to ever fight us again. Right. And so they right. tried to make that out of him. And I always say that in that way, what they were trying to do failed um, because there's those of us that still fight the system, that still stand up every day that fight for what's right that fight for our traditional ways and if they had been successful in what they were trying to do to leonard we wouldn't be able to do any of those things today um so i mean obviously it, it is disheartening that he was denied parole um although not surprising and so there's already a lot of strategizing going on because his next um avenue to freedom would be clemency uh through biden through the current president of the united states and um you know at the end of his term i think that there would be a good chance of um you know like a clemency or a commutation of his sentence and even you know through that avenue if that doesn't work that he is eligible for parole again in another two years so this is you know the I think a lot of the media has been like, okay, well, this was his last chance. Every, you know, it's all over now. But it's clear, you know, this is an ongoing movement. There's still strategizing going on. Um, you know, this is uh, this is something where there's other avenues and there's other strategies uh, that are being looked at. And again and again, those in power, they tell us things are impossible. They can't be done. But then we see that, you know, with enough pressure, the right circumstances and uh, uh, the right scenarios, we can actually achieve uh, some of these things that they tell us are uh, impossible. Yeah, and I think at this last, um, one of the more recent conversations that Leonard had with CEO and president of Indian Collective, Nick Tilson, you know, he said, I haven't given up and I hope that you all won't either. And so as long as Leonard hasn't given up, we're not going to give up. Um, you know, and there was this, and there is still a push that, each one of these opportunities could be his last opportunity right at freedom um you know he he does have very very poor health and he is an elder he's getting very elderly he walks around you know the usp with a walker um so i mean was this parole hearing his last chance at freedom who knows maybe right. you know we never when the creator is going to call us home so that could have been his last chance he might not make it until um, Biden could grant him clemency or commutation of sentence. He might not make it to his next eligible parole hearing. Okay. And so these are very real situations and circumstances. Um, it's not like, you know, some people think it's just like propaganda or like a strategy to put pressure on the system for his. It's very real. His medical right. condition, health condition is, is very, very real. Um so yeah, in that way, um, we have to be, we have to be really honest and, and, and honest with ourselves and honest with like media and other people that this, it's getting closer and closer every day that he's going to have less and less time. Yep. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate all the work that's being done. Um, and I hope that there is a success as soon as possible. Um, I, I did want to just talk a little bit about uh, some of the things from the end of last year um, that I had mentioned, um, kind of work our way backwards. Uh, I watched the really great uh, Minnesota to Palestine teach-in uh, from the Red Nation. I watched the whole thing twice, which is like, I don't know, if you ask my wife, I don't really like watching things over again. Like, I don't want to make a big deal about it, but I was like, I was like, we got to we gotta watch this again because there's so much good stuff in there. Um, and I was really ex excited to hear about the Indigenous Protector Center um, that you had mentioned during that um, teach-in. Um, so important and so needed. Can you talk about uh, the creation of the center? And I was going to say, you know, how it's intended to support the community, but I mean, how it has been uh, supporting the community and what kinds of things uh, y'all have been doing uh, since then? Right. So... Our organization um, is the Indigenous Protector Movement, or IPM for short. Um, we're a pretty new organization. We were just like officially founded in November. Um, but all of us that are like co-founders, board members, or now our current staff um, come from like a long history of grassroots uh, movement work over our lifetimes. Um, and so the Indigenous Protector Movement is kind of was born out of this need in community. And when I say in community, I'm speaking on South Minneapolis, um, in the indigenous community for an action-based organization. So when we say action, we mean um, that could be a protest, a march, a rally, a community event, a gathering, a ceremony, um, like whatever that action would be being taken place in the indigenous community um, and these actions being led by community members and that us as an organization are able to step in to provide people, expertise, resources um, for those actions to be as effective and elevated as possible. Um, so a lot of our work has specifically been focused on um, protecting and keeping community safe, right? And so like we talk a lot about, and I mean talk, I mean like amongst our team that mm -hmm. how do we as indigenous people through our sovereign rights as indigenous people protect our own when the system fails to do so, right? And so right. like you get into this thing like where, you know, Minneapolis Police Department doesn't respond to calls or missing and murdered indigenous relatives are just like, I see a new, new, new faces on Facebook every day. Mm -hmm. um, we have this drug epidemic that is like ravaging our people. And so how do we as people, as community protect ourselves, protect our people, protect our community when all of these things are going on. And so like that is really this been the center of our conversations lately. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's sad, honestly, because you can listen and read to conversations or speeches from civil rights movement activists and leaders from the 70s and 80s, and they still apply today right. to in South Minneapolis, you know, they talk about, um, of course, like then they were dealing with alcohol more, um, but still like that same conversation was happening. Um, they talk about police brutality, that same conversation is happening, you know, the DOJ investigation and report that Native people were found to experience police brutality um, and violence from the Minneapolis Police Department more so than any other demographic. And that right. was like a recent study. We're talking about post George Floyd's murder. Right. Um, and so we really like to not like to, we do strategize as a team and as a community on how we can combat these kind of issues that are happening. And unfortunately, even though like Minneapolis is our community, right? Like that's where we're centered. These are mm -hmm. issues we see across the board in urban indigenous populations across Turtle Island. Um, and so like, I think that these strategies that we're talking about these conversations that we're having, these blueprints that we're building um, could be applied here and then 
spread across Turtle Island and maybe help other communities as well. Um, so we did, we opened an office on Franklin Avenue. Um, we have a small office that we've been operating out of just above Maria's, mm. um, you know where that is, but yep. Yep. <laughs> um, across from, across from NAC, across from the Native American Community Clinic. Um, and so what we have been discussing is the development of what we're right now calling like a community safety center, um, where it would be a center that would be like our office space would also be like a center that a lot of our community based safety patrols could function out of, you know, whether it's the Little Earth Protector, Men's Warrior Society, Many Shields, or a Women's Warrior Society or AIM Patrol could utilize this space to operate out of a, the most effectively and efficiently to respond to community needs. Mm -hmm. um, there would be community space that's accessible and affordable for community um, and that there would be space that was safe and protected like for traditional ceremonies and traditions to happen. Um, so these are some of the things that like we're talking about. Um, and then the other thing that we've really been focusing on is our missing and murdered indigenous relatives um, and supporting those families that are unfortunately um, navigating these tragedies that have happened um, and how we can be most effective in amplifying their stories, not only for justice for their individual stories, but also creating change in policy so that some of these things don't happen again because um, some of it can be prevented. Are there, um, just kind of quick follow-up, are there ways that people can support the work or, or what, I mean, is that, if people are like, I want to support this, like, is there a way that they can do that at this point or, and what, and what is the best way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So our organization, like, um, we are member or volunteer based. So anytime anybody wants to show up, um, at any of our events, volunteer, get involved. Um, we're always more than happy to have everybody join. It's not just for indigenous people, it's for all people, right? Because a lot of these issues affect everybody. Um, and we're about indigenous issues being amplified and led by indigenous people, but we welcome anybody, all allies to come and join us. Um, we are on pretty much all social media. So like Facebook, Instagram, you know, TikTok, we have our personal pages. And then we also have the Indigenous Protector Movement pages. Um, and anytime that we're having um, a community event and action, um, all of those details are always shared on there. And um, everybody, we, we encourage everybody to come show up. So they can look for events on there. And then if they want to get more involved when they come to the event, they can connect with uh, some of the leaders and see if there's things that they can plug in to help with and find out, yeah. you know, how they, they can. Mm -hmm. They can also um, just write us, like we have our sure. email on there, write the, you know, send a message on the page. Um, there's always one of us usually in the office, so they can, you know, come stop by, come okay. chop it up, talk, see what's going on and how they can get involved. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's great. Um, you know, I wanted to go back a little bit further um, to August. Um, I had recorded a really another really powerful event, the Justice for All Stolen Lives rally in March, in August. Um, and it was, you know, there was people, you know, who had experienced especially, uh, you know, state violence of all different kinds. Uh, you know, there's wrongful imprisonment. It was really like an event, you know, showing solidarity, bringing people together. Um, and you said something, uh, you said at that event, uh, quote, something is going on in Anoka, uh, and quote, specifically, you know, speaking to the deaths of Miles Jackson and Christian Rivera Coba. Um, I know you mentioned at that time that AIM and others would be continuing to seek answers. Um, and I was just curious if there was any, you know, new information on that um, front or uh, anything else going on there as far as, um, you know, getting justice for, for those folks. So current, so Miles, Miles Jackson, the one year anniversary of his death was just 
last week. Um, and so we're still in contact with family members um, in pursuing justice and continuing to elevate these stories and these names. Um, what I would say right now, the update is, it's really difficult to navigate these systems that are not connected, right? So you have Anoka, you have Hennepin, you have the healthcare system, you have all of these independent institutions that are collectively under the same bill, but have zero interconnectedness and zero accountability to each mm. other. And so like, unfortunately, like with Miles's case, that's where it gets caught up where it's like, okay, so he was, MPD had him and then he went to Hennepin County and then he was in transit and then he popped up in Anoka and then he was in the healthcare system and then he was back in Anoka. And so when I'm talking about that, there's two avenues to justice here, that there's like the individual um, tragedy and then there's the policy change. So like that's something like with policy change that we're currently looking into and strategizing with some of our partners is how do you, we get better transparency? How do we get investigations and accountability into these systems? Like obviously MPD was investigated by the Department of Justice, right? Right. Well, what about Ferris office? What about the healthcare system? What about these surrounding counties that have these injustices that are linked up just as much as MPD is? Um, so we're currently strategizing and looking into those avenues too for policy change um, and investigations into those different institutional systems. Yeah, the, you know, especially the Minneapolis police and a lot of these other departments, you know, I've covered on the show have like a, uh, it's like a, almost like a policy of, of uh, shifting blame and avoiding accountability and putting one document over here and one document over there and putting things in all these different places so that people can't, um, you know, find things. I've had people, you know, who deal with police forces and the federal government nationally tell me that in Minneapolis and in Minnesota, like sometimes it's harder to get information than almost anywhere else that they've experienced. Because again, they're shifting this stuff around. So I, def I definitely get what you're uh, what you're saying with that. Those uh, those organizations, you know, kind of try to hide behind uh, each other uh, mm -hmm. to avoid any kind of like you know. And again, transparency. I mean, that's the big thing is that you know most of the time we just don't have transparency into what's going on and what these agencies say. If, you know, to start with, like for example, just take the case of George Floyd, the probably the best known situation in the country in the world. You know, the, all the stuff they said to start with was just all BS, right? Like all the all the narratives that they spun were just completely uh, mm -hmm. made up, um, and mm -hmm. it took you know it took huge community pressure to actually get any uh, you know accurate information about what was um, what was going on. Well, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the work. Um, I'm really excited about the uh, Indigenous Protector Center in South Minneapolis. Um, and I just wanted to see it, you know, before you go, is there anything else that you want to share either about, um, you know, the, you know, the movement or, um, other situations that people should be aware of before you go? Um, you know, the Amer okay. So the American Indian movement mm -hmm. was founded in 1968 officially in Minneapolis to fight police brutality. Um, I come from an AIM family and long time of hearing stories of AIM um, and what it means to be, quote unquote, an AIMster. Um, the movement and the fight for this, this work and injustices that we face, that work and that fight has a spirit, right? And that's what some people call like that warrior spirit, that spirit that comes up inside of you like when you know what you're supposed to do and you take action to do it and I would just encourage everybody to follow that spirit that warrior spirit inside of them because everybody knows what's right you know what's right and just follow that 
um, and whether that leads you, you know, to getting involved with Indigenous Protector Movement or AIM, or you go volunteer on the weekends um, at a shelter, or you go and spend time with youth, that there are lots and lots of ways to answer that warrior spirit. Like not everybody has to be out boots on the ground. Like we need grant writers. We need people spending time with the children. We need people learning the language. And so not one person can do everything. That's why it takes a collective. Um, and just, I wanna really encourage everybody to stay positive, especially like with each other and stay kind with each other. Um, because not everybody can do everything. Well, I really appreciate that. And I, uh, I, I hope, I, I always hope this podcast embodies that spirit of, you know, staying positive, working together, um, you know, giving each other some, uh, some leeway and, and understanding and, and focusing our energy on, again, on the powers that be and holding them accountable and getting transparency. Thanks so much, Rachel. Yes, of course. Thank you, Nick. And that's our special interview. Thanks for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.